Don Paul and the Mob. Hey, it's time for some humor on my podcast, Don Paul's Bits of Blather on weather, climate, and some humor. And the beauty, if there is any in this humor, is that it's all true. I guess you have to take my word for it. You know, I didn't go straight into television weather after I finished my studies in college. And I had a few jobs before that. And my most cherished pre-TV job was spending more than two years at WNEW Radio in New York. That was the station where Frank Sinatra started. It had the best local newsroom in American radio. And it was probably the most sophisticated adult station to be found anywhere. And that's, I fit right in. Hey, if Frank could start there, so could I. After all, I grew up in an apartment three miles north of his Hoboken apartment in Jersey. I snagged a job there as a desk assistant. That reads, hey, copy boy. That was for $92 a week in the newsroom. My rent for a basement studio right across the Hudson in Jersey was $155. I was living la vida broca but I was loving every minute of it. Now, because part of my job was to type traffic reports, which consisted of info I stole from the WCBS and WOR radio helicopter reporters, I even had to join the Writers Guild. And that bargain set of dues took me down to $89 a week. Well, to be an appreciated flunky at such an institution was a dream I really never knew I had. I cleared 12 teletypes every few minutes, hauled rolls of paper up from a roach-infested basement. But hey, I was working at a station on 5th Avenue and 46th Street where even the roaches had panache. While I was juggling these duties, I got a promotion to become an assistant to our chief reporter, Jim Gash. Jim had a vision handicap and he needed a literate driver and assistant who had some actual interest in news and could do some phone legwork for him, setting up interviews. He was a standout reporter, tough guy to work for. Every day was an adventure. We covered some great stories, and that was partly because Gash was pals with another great institution in New York media, WNBC-TV's Gabe Pressman, who died just a few years ago at age 93, and he was still producing weekly features for WNBC at the time. Now, Gabe and Gash liked each other. They used to feed each other stories, often biggies. Both of them were great at getting Governor Rockefeller or Mayor John Lindsay to say things to them that they wouldn't say to other reporters. My most memorable story was the shooting of Joe Colombo, the Brooklyn mob boss. It was a warm summer morning, and Gash told me to get an unmarked station mobile unit up to Columbus Circle, that's near the southwest entrance to Central Park on 59th Street, where the Ballyhood Italian-American Civil Rights Day rally was going to be celebrated. Now, in reality, this Civil Rights League turned out to be nothing more than a mafia front, which is one of the reasons I'm not that crazy about the use of the word mafia to describe Buffalo fans. Pretty serious business, but back to this business. Now, this league was trying to work up public anger toward all the ongoing federal arrests and indictments. It had been organized by Colombo against the wishes of all the other mafia dons who didn't want this kind of publicity. And Colombo demanded loyalty. In fact, he threw still liberal Frank Sinatra out of his league because Sinatra supported Mayor Lindsay for re-election over city controller Mario Procaccino. Well, that morning when I arrived at Columbus Circle, I parked our unit with its NYP license plates, that stands for New York Press, and I got out, and immediately a hefty guy said, hey kid, you can't park there. Pretty much that accent. I inquired as to why not, seeing that I had the NYP press plates, and with them you could park anywhere in New York, except in front of a hydrant or a diplomatic zone. So I asked the swarthy gentleman if he was a police officer. He responded curtly in the negative and urged me to move my expletive car. This was a man of little nuance. Well, we went back and forth, and even though I have a very slow fuse, I did begin to get a little feisty. There was a young cop standing nearby about my age, and he started to giggle, and he waved me over, and he asked, you know who you're arguing with? No. Who the hell is he? The cop said, 
That's fat Tony Salerno. Even I'm not sure I'd argue with that guy. Major mafia boss. You can look him up. Fat Tony Salerno. Well, my memory is hazy, but I do think I did move the unmarked green Chevelle to 59th Street. Later that morning, I was shooting the breeze with a copy boy, desk assistant from WINS All News Radio. Then another kind of shooting occurred. We thought it was firecrackers, but the firecrackers were gunshots. A move had been made against Colombo, whose henchmen immediately shot and killed the hitman before the cops could even intervene. Colombo had been shot in the head and the neck. He was rushed to nearby Roosevelt Hospital, where the press waited outside for word of what seemed to be his imminent death. I was in that press mob wearing my laminated NYPD press card when a black caddy limo pulled up. A few ominous looking types wearing dark suits got out. Some of the reporters hissed, that's Gambino. Carlo Gambino was the head mafia guy. WABC TV reporter who knew me from daily appearances back and forth said, take off that damn badge, kid. And go sidle over to those guys, see if you can hear what they're saying. And I did so, with pretty good stealth. But like Sergeant Schultz, I heard nothing. Just some mumbled grumbles. And when one of them noticed a kid was leaning in trying to eavesdrop, they all got back in the limo. Lape told me, thanks for nothing, kid. As for Columbo, he lived on for seven more years. He didn't get around much anymore, but he lasted longer than the next character in my story. Most mob leaders were convinced the hit was directed by Crazy Joe Gallo. Gallo was an arch Colombo enemy who, despite being a thug, managed to exude some charm, unlike Colombo, and even got into high society. He even befriended people like Jerry Orbach and his wife. What has this got to do with the story of my life? Well, about 15 years ago, David Letterman asked Don Rickles about having to work in mob-owned places early in his career, and Rickles quickly corrected Dave, said it wasn't that long ago. He was still dealing with wise guys. As a favor, in 1972, he played the Copa, the Copacabana, then owned by a shady character named Jules Padel. The owner warned him Crazy Joey was out in front. He told Don this heavy-duty mobster, could be friendly, but had a ferocious temper, and he strongly advised Rickles to lay off Gallo. Rickles said, Dave, that's like waving a red cape in front of me. Toro, Toro. Well, I went after him all night, and he loved it. Tears down his cheeks. Rickles said Gallo came backstage after the show and warmly begged Don to join him and his pals at Umberto's Clam Broth House. Well, Rickles came up with excuses. His wife was waiting in a hotel, Barbara, and he got out of it. This was fortunate for the world of comedy. That night, around 4, about 5 a.m., four gangsters came into Umberto's and disposed of Gallo with 38s and 45s. This was seen as extremely negative feedback for the Colombo hit. When I heard this Rickles story, I realized, unbeknownst to him, Donald J. Rickles reminded Donald J. Paul, we both do have those Donald J. names, that even as a flunky, I was on the fringes of mob history. I hope you've enjoyed this departure from science for this uh, episode. And uh, if you do, please share and follow. And again, this podcast is available on all platforms. Thanks.